Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. My name is Jillian McMaster, and I'm the manager of publications and media at the museum. Thank you for joining us tonight for Let's Talk Art with museum director Sarah Hall and Agnita M. Stein, Schreiber curator Daniel Fulco. Tonight, they will be discussing the Palazzo Chigi in Ariccia, home of the masterpieces featured in our current exhibition, Bernini and the Roman Baroque. Please feel free to ask any questions you have in the chat areas on Facebook and Zoom. Welcome, Sarah and Daniel. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight for this edition of Let's Talk Art, which is going to take an immersive look at the setting from whence our current exhibition originates, the Kiji Palace. I hope if you've already seen the, um, if you haven't seen our, the exhibition yet, that it whets your appetite. And if you have seen it, um, I hope that it brings you back to the museum again. One of the great pleasures of a museum with free admission is the fact that you can come back um, time and time again and make friends with the art. Right now, um, we also have a really impressive exhibition program with Bernini and the Roman Baroque simultaneously on view with the tour. I think it really showcases the breadth of what we can do with our exhibition program. We can do significant research and tell stories that are really relevant to our region. And in the case of Joshua Johnson, you know, relevant um, on a national and international level as well. He's a Baltimore, he was a Baltimore based artist. Um, but also we can bring the world to Hagerstown and we can provide right now some very much needed vicarious travel through this splendid exhibition which is also a wonderful educational opportunity. Um, I also wanted to mention that if you're out there listening and you're nearby um, and wanna drop in tomorrow from 11 to one, our director of education, Kelly Mealy is gonna have a pop-up program um, in the Rose Garden next to the museum called Baroque Beasts, um, where she'll um, provide some sculpting tips and talk about some of the uh, beasts that you might find in Baroque art and um, imaginative uh, ways of fashioning them. I also, when I'm on with you, always want to put in a plug for museum membership. Members of the museum receive advance notice of our activities. They receive discounts on fee-based programs and museum shop purposes, purchases, but most importantly, they help us do what we do um, by supporting our exhibitions and programs and helping us continue our 90-year tradition of free admission. I also want to mention that anyone, member or not, can go to our website and click in the upper right-hand corner and subscribe to our email newsletter. Um, you hear about what we're doing and you also get um, wonderful weekly emails uh, about highlights of the collection that Daniel writes um, called Weekend Art. So um, people really enjoy that. I get a lot of nice mail of people responding to those. So without any further ado, I'm gonna let Daniel start a screen share and we'll take a uh, really fascinating virtual tour of the Palazzo Chigi. Thank you, Sarah. And um, it is really gonna be fun tonight to give you a virtual tour of this fabulous Palazzo Chigi in the town of Ariccia. So here we go. And this is slide just gives you a sense of some of the works that are in our exhibition, Bernini and the Roman Baroque, Masterpieces from Palazzo Chigi. And tonight's discussion is gonna center around the building that you see down there on the lower left, the Palazzo Chigi. We're also gonna be talking about the great artist, John Lorenzo Bernini, the vision that he had for the town of Ariccia and for the Palazzo as a whole. And we're also gonna look at some highlights of the works in there, including the patron, uh, Flavio Chigi, he was a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church, and talk about his involvement with this as he actually lived here at one point in his life. So the Palazzo Chigi is a monument that went up in the, actually quite some time back in the Renaissance. Now, the town of Ariccia, as you're going to see today, was um, originally an ancient Roman settlement. It's located about 16 miles southeast of Rome. So here we go with a couple of maps. There's Rome, you can see where it is within Italy, talking about 17th century Italy specifically today. But here's a map here, modern times, and this gives you a sense of where it is. You get on the um, highway and you come all the way down here, and that's where the Palazzo is. It's in actually the, a lake district, not very far from there, near Castel Gantolfo, and also Lake Narni, also sometimes called Lake Narni. It's in a beautiful location. 
a regia. And you might ask yourselves, well, why, why pick this site, this location? There are a couple of reasons for it. And one of them is that the uh, Pope at the time, Alexander VII, he was a member of the Kiji family. And what he did was he actually acquired the estate, the land on which the Palazzo sits here. This is the town of Arecio. He acquired it from the Savelli family that owned it before. They were looking to uh, sell their property. And Alexander saw this as a strategic opportunity to gain proximity to the papal residence of the town of Castel Gandolfo. And that Castel Gandolfo is very close to Arecio, right there. So just up the road, a little northwest. And he picks this site as the site of their new country residence. And what he does is he commissions John Lorenzo Bernini in conjunction with Bernini's uh, workshop, as well as his colleagues, to build this new palazzo and to completely redesign the town. And by that, I'm referring to the infrastructure. This is a really nice photo here that was taken some years back, just showing you how the town looks at night from the very large bridge that leads into the town. And he and his nephew were going to sort of um, work on this together. Alexander primarily has the uh, sort of the ownership of the project, but his nephew, uh, Flavio, is going to take part in this. So this includes a complete redesigning of it. The road system, the waterworks, for example, and then also the uh, church architecture that you see there. Here are a couple of portraits of Bernini, one from earlier in his career when he was really young, and this one closer to how he would have looked in the 1660s when he did the project. This is from the end of his life in the 1680s, but this gives you a sense of how he appeared. And at this time, we might try to reimagine how did it reach look back in the 1600s. Well, here's a print by Giovanni Battista Faldi that's included in the exhibition. And Faldi was a student of Bernini. He also received a commission from the gentleman we're talking about here, a very important guy, Alexander VII Kiji. This incidentally is done by an artist who's in the show named uh, Bacicca, and his name might come up here and there. He too, like Faldi, is a close follower of Bernini. But let's take a look at this print for a minute. When this was done by Faldi in the 1600s, he starts to pick out the major sites on which the Palazzo sits. This is looking at it from down below. So it's set up on top of this enormous uh, cliff hillside. And you can see the rock formations here. You have the Assumption Church, the Collegiate Church that's shown here, and there's the Palazzo. So this kind of a print would be distributed to a wide variety of people in the 1600s, specifically people of means who came to Rome to do their grand tour, which involved going into Rome and seeing famous works of art and monuments, but also traveling out to the countryside, to places like Arecio. And that's who, the market for which Father was gearing these prints. And he does a series. So I'm going to say this again for people. Can you go back to the print? So um, enlarge it again for folks because it is really delightful to look at. So if you imagine being a sort of person of means at this time period who either has um, the means to get a hold of these um, before a trip and do a little fantasizing and planning the way we might buy travel books or take it, take it home as a memento afterwards. Um, there's just such incredible, charming detail in the bottom right. There are some field workers, so that little figures and charming little vignettes. And then what I find kind of amusing is all the way up at the left on the horizon, Daniel, there is um, a, a fountain. And Falda actually did a book just of Roman fountains. So I love the fact that, um, you know, he's looking at this level of detail because it's about documenting these famous sites, but it's also about appealing to people and marketing things. And this is really sort of the beginning of a, of a tourist industry. Yes. Yeah, so we can move on now, but I think a lot of, you know, in the show, we have five of these etchings and people probably don't spend as much time looking at them, but they are really delightful. Uh, very much so, uh, sir. I totally agree. And I'm glad you brought that up because what Falda is going to lay the basis for is actually to create, to make Arecha into a tourist attraction. And in some of the slides, we're gonna see how that actually starts to play out if you go up uh, down through the centuries. So that's really neat to uh, discuss that as well. 
that is the marketing, the, to the tourism of Italy, which of course lasts until today. These are some drawings that show you how Carlo Fontana and John Lorenzo Bernini were conceiving the reconstruction of the town of Riccia and specifically the Palazzo. These are in the uh, archives in the Vatican, the apostolic archives, and these show you their initial ideas. Here are some of the drawings that Carl Fontana did. Now Fontana is a very close pupil of Bernini and how the process would have worked is they would have started with something very rough like this, a sketch just showing approximately where the Palazzo is gonna sit and what's gonna be in relation to it, specifically the Church of the Assumption, which is across the street. Then that's gonna to move to something like this and you can see the, stair the small staircase that leads up to the Palazzo and then across the street, the layout, the ground plan of the church. So we wanna keep these kind of, this is actually over here in the Palazzo and then this is the church with the dome and then the porch. This being the initial concept for something much larger. And this is how Bernini worked. He had an, a large number of people in his midst that uh, were working with him. And the idea was to create a total work of art and architecture. Here is how that plays out today in a modern day view. Here is the large bridge that actually carries the Via Appia Nuova or Italian State Highway 7 that comes into the town. But this is actually an ancient Roman road that's been modernized and it runs right past the palazzo. So you can see here it has multiple levels and then it faces the church. It's part of a, a small scale urban renewal of the city of Arecio at the time. So Bernini is an urban planner. And we mentioned before, Sarah had mentioned before Falda, well, this is how he begins to market and promote the town of Arecio. This is the Corte Square that Bernini and Fontana and many others are working on. And here's an in interior view, a cross section of the Collegiate Church of the Assumption. Again, wonderful details of daily life. These are just really neat. See the carriage and then the people who are gathering in the square. We've got a fountain. And then also you can see some of the details of the architecture, the facade, the porch, the pediment, the dome. And there's the palazzo over there. Notice how they have numbers. They were keyed at that time to make for easy viewing. And then when you go inside, it's just gorgeous. You have the coffered dome and then you have the apse of the church itself. So these would have been widely distributed throughout Europe, thereby disseminating knowledge of the city and of the work of Bernini. Now, as we come down through the centuries into the 1700s and then into the 1800s, many famous people are gonna visit Palazzo Chigi, including Goethe, who made a little drawing. This is just a lovely little work that he did during his Italian journey, which you may be familiar with. In the late 1700s, he would go there. This was one of his stops. We have the famous French painter, Charles Joseph Natoir. Many French artists were down in Italy and in Rome. And each of them includes different kinds of aspects of daily life. In this case, people are relaxing and enjoying the rural atmosphere. You even have a farmer here with cattle. And there's the Palazzo on the hill. German artist Hocker does a beautiful painting of the ground surrounding the Palazzo. Very expansive landscape painting. And you get a sense of the building at that time. And then down here is a 19th century engraving when the, the uh, bridge is actually reconstructed and made much larger. Again, the Palazzo and the church. You can see it in the distance. So once you come down into the 19th century, tourism to the city was really quite established. So I love that variety of imagery that you chose, Daniel, because you see Goethe's really personal, like a little aid memoir, um, you know, to, to um, uh, his own experience of the space. And I've often told people, and I've done a little of this myself, that even if you're not an artist, um, draw when you're traveling because it it helps, uh, you know, make your memories more powerful. So even if you have a bad drawing as a memento of a trip, um, it, it is in some ways more powerful than a photograph, I think. So uh, I see that in uh, Goethe's sweet little drawing, this very personal way that um, drawing connects to our memory of place. Yes, it certainly does. And each of these is a, is a memory, it's a recollection of going to this really enchanted place and spending time here in the Roman countryside, which was so popular for people on their grand tour. 
from all over Europe. Very famous artists came through here, like Corot, you see on the upper left there, like Goethe, he's down below in the park grounds, which by the way, are really quite extraordinary too, if you have a chance to explore. So I'm, I'm gonna sure. interrupt, so there is still, um, and, and I'm sorry, I didn't have time to look this up before we were on tonight, but my understanding is there are still the remnants of a sort of classical period garden um, on the grounds, which I think is really fascinating. fascinating. Yes, it is indeed. And I think they were they were repurposed from nearby monuments, if I'm not mistaken. And one of them was redeveloped into an aviary, I think. Oh, that's, I, I've seen uh, notes notes about the aviary. So yes. And is it the garden dedicated to Diana or a specific? I think it might be. Yeah. Um, so there's something to do more research on. But it, the idea that, you know, for us, we're looking back you know, 360 years, but there's more, there's much more history there than, than the Kijis, you know, it goes way back further. It certainly does. And somebody like John Ruskin, this is one of those beautiful works that he did possibly on the spot of the town from down below, like Goethe, but the way he does it is so different. It's very romanticized. John Ruskin, the famous English critic, but also an artist, and ever present in mid-1800s in art criticism on both sides of the Atlantic, America, England, and elsewhere. Truth to nature. That's, uh, that's what you think of when you think of John Ruskin, and um, this feeling that they're, you know, the recording all of the facts of uh, the natural world has some kind of, you know, higher, higher truth to it. Indeed. And that will soon bring us to the Palazzo Chigi itself. Remember on that drawing we were looking at before where Bernini and his assistants were working out the stairway, this design here that almost takes on geometric form. That's actually worked out in the end. Sometimes in a preliminary drawing, an idea will not stick through, but with Bernini it did in this instance. And one of the entrances to the Palazzo is here. I believe this wing was added later in the 1700s that you're looking at that goes up higher, if I'm not mistaken. There's also a little gateway on the side. This shows it in a bit more detail, what it would look like as you're approaching it, including a fountain at the- So it'd be very hard to imagine the interior from the exterior. <laughs> That's right. You see it on the outside, it's so plain, but as you're gonna see when we go inside, depending on which room you're in, it's really quite a different experience. It's it's sober. I mean, it's monumental. It's imposing. Um, you know, it's a significant building, but it's very sober, and uh, it's it's not the way you you feel on the inside necessarily. Yes. Some of the works in the exhibition that relate to the town of Arecha that if you're able to see the show, you'll make some connections. We've got Bernini and his pupil. Uh, Trevani that do a series of medals dedicated to Pope Alexander the Seventh, and these are really neat because they depict important buildings in the town, and these were would have been circulated in the time of the Pope. You see the facade and the dome of the actual collegiate church of the Assumption. There is Alexander the Seventh. The same for the sanctuary of Galoro in Arecha, shown here on this one, and these are gilded bronze with Latin inscriptions that glorify the Pope. So I wanted to just pull those in. And you can see how Bernini is always such a great sculptor. Look at the detail he achieves on his mustache and beard. And this really speaks to his tremendous sensitivity to depicting um, human emotion and psychology in different works. We also have other medals that are on view in the exhibition, also commissioned by the Pope. And more prints by Falda. I mentioned before the sanctuary of Galora in Arecha. This is in another important monument that has very ancient and medieval connections in terms of a cult of the Virgin that was worshiped here for quite some time. And this is really impressive facade with these volute scrolls and this very imposing tall facade. Again, Bernini and his workshop responsible and a cross section of the interior with people down below to show how grand the scale was at the time, these being tourists very likely, tying into Falda's interest in gearing them towards the grand tour of people. 
would be on their grand tour. This is what the actual sanctuary looks like. Again, all around the early 1660s. Not very, very large at being a sanctuary. And then when you go inside, you have an element of surprise with these huge pendentives in the dome leading up to the altar. Just to show you in relation, this is not the only property of the Kiji family. If we quickly digress and go back to Rome, we go here to the, to the Corso, which is the main artery inside of, uh, in, in the uh, city of Rome. And here in the Corso, there's the Via del Corso right here, off of there is the main city palace of the Kiji family. And it was done by, again, people in Bernini's circle, Felice della Greca and Giovanni Battista Contini. So this is where they would retreat to in the summertime. They would go to do business here in Rome, and then they would go out to reach it being much cooler. This is located today in Palazzo Colonna, and it is the primary residence of the Italian prime minister. Back to the town, and then again, you can see how it looks from each side of the uh, bridge. And here you go. We've got Bernini, and then this is Carlo Fontana, his pupil. I just wanted to put some faces with the names. The bridge is really quite monumental. You pull up here, and then you enter in that way. So it is now, and, and I'm sure you have this as part of the content later on, but it was uh, purchased from the family, I think, in 1988, and I think opened to the public in 2000, if my memory is, is correct. Um, I think there was some, you know, uh, restoration and preparation for making it a public space, but now it is a sort of house museum and uh, they do concerts and events and uh, they also have created the Museum of, of the Roman Baroque there on the site of the Palazzo. So you can visit it if you manage to get yourself to Italy. Indeed. And while you're there, you've got two monuments facing one another that are really interesting, both the Palazzo and briefly here, the Collegiate Church of the Assumption. This being a part of Bernini's conception of me uh, melding architecture and art, the visual art together. And I thought this would represent it nicely because in that church across the street from the Palazzo, we've got some artists who are in the exhibition, particularly this guy up here, Jacques Courtois, who is known as the Il Borgognone, the Burgundian. And this is a fresco of the Apotheosis of the Virgin. And Courtois is primarily known for his battle scenes. There he is standing in front of one of his etching. And here's the image of Bernini. But he also did religious paintings like this. So Courtois, a student of Bernini, worked with him together on this entire total work of art that you see. Bernini designing the dome, which is just beautiful. You can see it takes its inspiration from the Pantheon in Rome. And you can look through the lantern here into the oculus. And then the sculptor Antonio Raggi did the stuccos that you see up at the top. So it's a, co a combination, it's a collaboration among painters, an architect, and a sculptor. This really embodies Bernini's idea of a complete work of art. And now we're going to take a look at actually, as we approach the palace virtually, this is showing one of the fountains on the ground designed by Bernini. And here a courtyard, we're going to shortly go inside. It's actually very sober, as you can see. Not much decoration. And it even is that way as you enter the palace, you will go up one of the staircases and you find yourself in a place called the Sala uh, Parafrineri. And the Sala Parafrineri, uh, basically in English, it translates to uh, the... the uh, sort of the groom's room, a, a palafreniero in Italian is a, somebody who would have accompanied uh, a carriage and taking care of the horses. So the idea was that they would drop off guests. They would arrive here, they'd go up the stairs and be received by palace officials. So this is where you first come into. This big coat of arms here represents the uh, duties of uh, the Kiji family members of the marshals of the Catholic Church. Copies of ancient Roman statuary are on view, and also statues, busts of different Kiji family members. And here we have a couple, a guy we're going to be talking about tonight, Cardinal Flavio, very important for our discussion, and there's his uncle, the Pope, Alexander VII, by these two artists. Really quite beautiful. These artists are clearly influenced by Bernini. You have the spontaneity and the immediacy 
Look at the drilling of his hair here. And the same for Uncle Alexander. Just stunning works. These would have been meant to impress visitors to the palace. So once you come off of the staircase, I don't have a floor plan with me, but try to envision that you're going to come into this grand hall called the Sala Maestra in Italian. And this is where you will be received at first. You're, by the way, you're upstairs on the main floor, which is called the Piano Nobile. Downstairs are the private apartments of Cardinal Chigi. And this room was used for a variety of things in the 1600s to receive important guests, but also to hold spectacles and specifically operas and um, evening concerts way back then, including some very early operas. And it, this was the site of hosting distinguished guests. One of Flavio's friends was Queen Christina of Sweden, who actually became an expatriate, as some of you may know, and she stayed down in Rome and sort of relocated there due to political events at home in Sweden. And she was present for one of those particular performances. To this day, the Palazzo continues to host different kinds of events in here, including concerts and conferences and lectures. But try to imagine yourself in here back in the 1600s. It would have been decorated probably very differently. But today, the Kiji collections, as it's an active museum, as Sarah mentioned, are continuing to put works out. A couple of anecdotes, you might wonder why this frame is missing a canvas. It's because in 1944, when the Nazis occupied the town, they stole several works of art. This one, of course, has not been located. But just to add that in this, Palazzo has been through many different um, trials and tribulations of history. Now, moving from there, right off of the, uh, of the main hall, in this space here is a small chapel. And if you were a distinguished enough guest, you might be welcomed into there. It's very beautiful, it's quite intimate. It would have been used for private ceremonies like you can see here. This work is actually done by Bernini in his workshop. And then up above here, we have an altarpiece with these beautiful, what appear to be silk and or leather co um, coverings on the walls. That's a closer view of the altar. So this kind of a space would have required some status to get into it. Take, take a look at the silk on the curtains on the drapery. So that's like the red silk that we do have in the exhibition, it appears. So with the, the oak leaves and the six mountains and emblems of the Kiji coat of arms. So that's fun to see that in situ. Yes, and I believe, Sarah, I have another slide later on where I brought the actual piece that we have displayed at the museum. Right. And some of these furnishings were repurposed from different uh, properties that belong to the Kiji family, specifically that city palace I showed you. So we were, go having, ahead. Having worked at a house museum for a, a good portion of my career, um, and authenticity being something, you know, many experiences when you go into house museums are sort of um, recreations. They're left with a shell of a building or they're left with a few things. And so historians go out and shop and try to find appropriate things. But the Palazzo Kiji is unusual because where when they don't necessarily have everything that was in that Palazzo, they have a lot of the family things from Rome as well. So there, there is a very high level of authenticity in the furnishing and um, the experience of being there. Indeed. And we can see how some of this is still preserved within the Palazzo. Though changes have been made over the centuries, you have a lot of original decoration. And here we're looking at the summer dining room, which is not far off from, it's on the main floor of that great hall that we were in before. It's my today, favorite room so far. <laughs> this one is really great, isn't it, Sarah? It's beautiful. And these grand uh, French doors, they open onto a terrace that overlooks the gardens and the fountains. This is really neat. This would have been used for summer dining. A couple of details here. Look at these peacocks and these birds. How much fun this is. Completely delightful. Yeah, completely delightful. And some surprises too, including mischievous monkeys on a balustrade with watermelons and other fruits and flowers. We've got a bird here. So the idea of the artist who created this was to bring you outdoors while you were still indoors. It's illusionistic painting and very fun. 
if you continue your tour through or off of that room, you're going to come to a place called the Hall of the Servants, or Hall, actually, of Herb Sauces, which I found to be an amusing name <laughs> for the room. That's great. And exactly how it got that name, I don't know, but it has preserved on the wall here some frescoes, which likely date for, again from the 1600s, affording you views of the Alban Hills of Rome and clearly today used for concerts. And within this room is something that might be familiar to you, um, especially if you have a chance to visit the exhibition. This here is a beautiful uh, lantern that we have on view in our Bowman Gallery with other works. And I believe this is the one that was perhaps removed from the Palazzo to be part of the show, Sarah. I think you're probably right about that, yeah. And, uh, and this is really beautiful. Look at these puti that are carrying this crown that has the stars of the, from the Kiji coat of arms up into the heavens and also representative of the uh, Madonna as well. In terms Love of that. Look at the, the, the bodies of the puti and the, the sort of turning motion, the sense of, of movement. It's, it's really lovely. And it is, I think, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, the exhibition is about Bernini's influence and we have examples of some of the work he's done and we talk about his relationship with the family but of course most of Bernini's major work is fixed in place and so um, this gives a taste um, for that you know baroque drama in sculpture and, and delight as well I think having having the having the ceiling lamp it certainly does and the the palazzo really is a delight um, we, after we come out of that room, we enter into the Sala Albani. And I should mention that the rooms that were in here are actually would have been open more to um, more of a general audience. When we afterwards, when we get downstairs into the Cardinal's private chambers, you would have had to have special uh, social rank in order to be admitted there. How it worked in the 16 and 1700s was the, more, the higher your rank was within the aristocracy, the deeper into the palazzo you got. So if you were somebody of lower rank, you would only go perhaps to an antechamber a few rooms in. If you actually got into the cabinet or the state bedroom or beyond that, you were very important. So that's just something to mention as we go through these rooms. And I should also say that these have been altered quite a bit. This one is perfect because of course the palazzo is nestled almost right at the, the within the Alban Hills. And we've got some neat things in here, including those elaborate wall coverings. And look at this model here. And I believe this actually survives from the time of Bernini, if I'm not mistaken, could be recreated. But it shows the Palazzo and the Church of the Assumption uh, that are done on a small scale, displayed on the table. Which is a neat addition. And then over here, these are the two lakes. Lake Albano, which is shown up here, very close by for recreation and sightseeing and then Lake Narni or Narni, which is very close to Aricia. This is looking out towards the, this may be looking actually towards Aricia in Rome, here towards Castel Gandolfo, the other residence of the popes. This is a detail here within the Alban room, really beautiful. These would appear to be leather coverings for the walls. From there, we move into the pharmacy. And this is a very interesting room, which combines uh, ancestral imagery with also practicality. And in here, you had Cardinal Flavio Chigi's personal library of various books. And at the time, in a palace like this, you would have had a pharmacy in case the uh, members of the aristocracy, members of the noble family got sick. They would need to have medications at their disposal that could be compounded by an apothecary. And today, what it does is it houses these different collections. But each of these portraits is actually oil on copper, and it shows all the different ancestors of the Kiji family, going back to the late Middle Ages. So it's quite extensive. Including, isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Here they are, engravings, and all these copper portraits, so many people. It also has some curiosities, I think, displayed in there, too. Here we have the Camarosa, or the Red Room, 
And this gives is a recreation of a space that gives you an idea of how you would have slept and or lived in the 1600s. Again, silk uh, wall coverings, a bed, because people at that time were very much shorter. You have the canopy in the days here. And then you also have a uh, prayer stool for private devotion. And note also they've put, included a painting of the crucifixion. While this may not have been a, the exact configuration back in the uh, Baroque period, it gives you a sense of how things would have looked. And note the use of red again. This is another detail there of the pharmacy with those portraits that gives you a sense of what they look like. And then these are the medicines, different herbs and ointments stored in different jars and labeled. So very neat. Now moving from there, we come into a room that relates to one of the paintings that's on view in the exhibition. And this is called the Hall of the Beauties. Originally, it wasn't located in this exact space. This has been somewhat recreated, but it gives you an idea of this room that uh, Flavio Chigi had made to showcase the different beautiful women of his era. And According to contemporary accounts, he was quite the womanizer, as we read about. And I, I think I read that this was not necessarily an unusual thing, that the, you know, people would, other people probably had their collections of beauties as well, or the portraitists would even, you know, do, do the however many women and, you know, make copies for other people to have in their own salons. So um, kind of funny. It certainly is, and in this case, actually, um, the woman that we're looking at, we're looking at two sisters here. We have um, up above, this was, a, by the way, all of the portraits originally in here were commissioned from Jacob Ferdinand Boe, who did the famous portrait of Flavio Chigi. And up here we have Maria, and we have her sister Hortensia Mancini. And some of you may know the Mancini sisters. They, they were sent actually to Louis XIV's court, and he, um, fell in love with Maria in particular. Hortensia was there too. She provided the inspiration for Flavio to commission this Hall of Beauties. But when Louis XIV retired of Maria, she actually ended up having quite a, a challenging life. She actually entered into a relationship with the Cardinal, according to contemporary sources. And um, it's really quite interesting to read about this because I think that the Cardinal actually met her when he was at the court of Louis XIV. He was there in the 1650s and early 60s. So some of this has to do with international politics and diplomacy and the exchanges between different noble houses. And you're right, sir, it certainly was common. The other Italian aristocratic families at the time uh, also uh, commissioned these different kinds of uh, galleries of beauties. So the Kijis are sort of competing with their fellow Italian families. I, you know, obviously when we look at these today, we, we admire, particularly Voet is so good at this kind of portraiture, right? Um, and so it's about displaying status as well as beauty. And um, just part of that for women is of course, through their adornments and through the amazing clothing and the expensive fabrics. And um, of course, Italy was making some of the most luxurious fabrics in the world in, in this time period. Uh, so it's, um, it's all uh, very, uh, you know, a sort of feast for the eyes. They're very sensual portraits in lots of ways. And they are. This one here, we have the uh, of Maria Isabella Capranica Cherry. And this one is on view in the museum's Kirsten Gallery in the exhibition. It's really quite extraordinary. And this one was part of the Gallery of Beauties, this specific portrait. And they all date from around the 1670s. You can see the the the, the sort of tubular um, torso, the stays that she's wearing that are are giving her that sort of almost cone shape. Um, really uh, interesting history of fashion. Yes. If we make our way out of that room, we will eventually arrive at the nuns' room, which displays different relatives, family members of the Kiji family through intermarriage, cousins as well. 
and a wonderful painting um, among our favorites in the exhibition by Francesco Trevisani of Sister Maria Bernice Kiji. And it's actually, I think it's on view up here on the wall if I'm not mistaken, but it is actually uh, on display in this room. And here she is. Just the, the light on this painting is just amazing. Uh, when you see it in person, it's stunning. And this was a common profession for many women in noble houses at the time. Some were destined for careers marrying off to other European aristocrats while others were sent to convents. Not very much unlike what happened to Flavio Chigi being sent off to be a man, of, to be a cleric, to be a member of the church. This was something that happened very frequently. Now within this part of the palace, you also have a room of some great canvases, including the winter dining room that contains a series of allegories. And in this case, they are done by two artists, uh, several artists, different ones trading off. In our exhibition, we have Maratas and Nuzzi's Summer, which is really an outstanding painting. It's an allegory of summer, but look at all the flowers. This is a personification here looking at herself in a mirror. His colleague Nuzzi, or Mario de Fiori, as he was known, did all of these flowers for each of the seasons. Down below is a work done by one of his colleagues, Jacinto Brandi, who is also represented in the exhibition, and this is of autumn. I just loved finding these because, you know, they're sending an example from the series on tour. Um, so when you know something's part of a series of four, I just want to know what the other three look like. <laughs> so it's, it's nice to see and imagine yourself surrounded by them. Yes, and here we have a self-portrait by Mario Nuzzi that shows you him actually painting these flowers. He has an assistant who's pulling out the flowers here from the basket, preparing them, getting them ready. So here's the artist at work, kind of interesting to see. In many cases, you could pick out the species of these. Here are the other two that are displayed in that winter dining room. And I should point out, in, a, in contrast to the summer dining room that we saw earlier with the outdoor imagery, Filippo Lowry, I should mention, is also represented in the show. This is spring. And then we've got winter by Bernardino May. Now from there, what you would do is you'd make your way out of that quarter of the palace, you're going to come back to the main hall. And then from there, you're going to veer off and go right and come into the Sala Gialla Rosso or the Yellow Red Room, which acted as an audience chamber. One side would have been, the side that we were on before would have been for, reserved for elder Kiji family members. Here on the right, some of these were shared by younger Kiji family members, as well as women of the house. So that's my understanding of how the uh, rooms were divided up. So an audience chamber would have been used for official political receptions like this, hence it being very elaborately decorated. Look at the coffered ceiling in here, carved out of wood, enormous chandeliers. You can see that later on in the palace's history it was repurposed to play uh, pool or billiards. And then we've got all kinds of portraits that are displayed against the yellow red silk hangings. Kiji family members also displayed, both in portraiture and in sculpture, different parts of the room. And you'll also note that we have a copy of the portrait of Flavio Kiji. There are several copies that were made in the Palazzo has a, a few of them. This one happens to be on view here, but it's not the original by Volwe. We'll see where that's hanging afterwards. If we keep going, we come into that room with the famous portrait of Flavio Chigi. This is called Sala del Truppo. And this was a kind of game that was played at the time. And it involved playing uh, sort of a, a ball game that's akin to uh, bowling. Um, sometimes people would gamble over it. And this room actually has, again, the use of silk wall hangings. Different members of the Chigi family are represented here. 
And this a fabulous painting, one of my favorites as well, showing Flavio Chigi and all of his finery and luxury. And you can see how it's displayed when it goes back home to the plaza on the wall. And that's a, for a sense of scale, I mean, that's actually a pretty large portrait. So, so um, we might be thinking about our own side tables and things when we look at that, but that's gotta be a fairly substantial side table um, to be, uh, you know, it's a pretty big portrait. It's quite large. And here, because of the size of the walls, it seems more, just, just in some regard, uh, for some reason, or domestic rather than palazzo domestic, but it is yeah. quite the scale. There are several other rooms here that were used by subsequent Kiji family members. We have the green room or Camera Verde, which contains some of the original furnishings. Give you a sense of how the people would have lived at the time. And this artwork that you're looking at wasn't all collected by uh, the Cardinal and his family members. It's been added in subsequent years, particularly when the museum started actively collecting this form. So if we come back out of those rooms, we come back into the main hall, the Sala Maestra, and then you go downstairs to see Flavio Chigi's original rooms, which you would have accessed through an antechamber. Now, again, you would have been somebody quite important in social rank to get into these rooms. On the walls, you have cousins and brothers. And again, on the ceiling, you've got all kinds of birds and, and natural naturalia imagery. And that's because Flavio Chigi actually had many of these creatures as part of his horoscope, as part of his interest in the zodiac. And we believe that Bernini and his assistants may have played a role in recommending to the Cardinal this kind of imagery for his private rooms. So we've got a series again, this one is in the exhibition, that was displayed in some, one of these rooms down here at the time, though they've moved around since then. Pier Francesco Mola of Bacchus, or Allegory of Taste, and then these two which are remaining in the palazzo. The one up above here, I believe, is, is the, I'm not uh, mistaken, sir, is this uh, autumn? Or let's see here. This is the sense of sight. These are the senses, but some of them also. Well, there are, like that is, so that's color. Yes, that's right. The blind Greek poet, Homer. And then down below, we have um, Narcissus with the sense of sight, hearing, and taste. And the other one, um, I'm trying to remember what the other one is. Um, what are we? What are we missing? <laughs> I think we it doesn't we have maybe, all the senses. It doesn't have all five, but there yes. is the one of the fellow looking over his shoulder. Um, yes. I can't I, remember what sense that is. I think it would be sense of smell, and um, there should be one other in there too. Touch. Oh Touch. yes. It, mm -hmm. But these are three selections yes, from he's, that he's, series. Mm -hmm. He's smelling a flower, I think, and, and kind of looking back over his shoulder, yeah. We do have a better sense of where certain works were with other rooms that are part of the, uh, originally part of the Cardinal's uh, suite. And this is called the Hall of the Dogs or, or the Dogs Room. And one painting that you may remember, by the way, I should mention that these were the Mola. Sarah discussed this in her Art Bites program um, a couple of weeks ago. And then last weekend, I was discussing the Yanda Momper in our second Art Bites series. So some of you may remember that. And Yanda Momper did a lot of work for the Cardinal in the Palazzo. This one is on view in the show. And it's a landscape with hunting scene from 1665. Very expensive. And it shows and reflects the Roman countryside near where it was commissioned. It would have been an overdoor to the room that you see over here that contains a series of different paintings of Flavio's dogs and specifically his greyhound. We'll get to that room in just a moment. A couple of other rooms that are here, we have the red silk hanging with the Kiji coat of arms. 
the mountain and the stars, as well as the oak leaves. And you can see how they pick up on other decorations that are shown here in one of the chapel rooms downstairs. This is recreated. And in addition, we have a hall of sort of curiosities of a gun called an arquebus, an Italian archibugio. Again, you can see some of those greyhounds that are scattered throughout these rooms. So the Palazzo really has a lot of different aspects of the Kiji family history. And here are those dogs. If you step inside this space, you would be able to see these all hanging on the wall. This one over here is right there. And then we come to the one in the center, or Greyhound, at the manor of Porto Ercole, and a Greyhound rabbit, and the castle of Riccio shown up here on the hill. So the idea was that the cardinal wanted to show off his numerous lands, and specifically where he would go hunting. These all belong to the Kiji family. They were their properties. And the dogs are shown running on there in different situations. The town of Formello, Porto Ercole, which is in Tuscany, along the sea, and then closer to home here in a region. The dogs chasing after the rabbits. Very dynamic paintings. These ones, though, are not done by Momper. They're done by a colleague of his by the name of Michelangelo Pace del Campidoglio. And they're, they're very yeah. dark. Yeah. They are yeah. monumental in scale. Yes, they're quite large, taking up almost this whole side of the wall. These rooms, um, contain, there are other rooms on this uh, suite that contain different kinds of rustic scenery. Um, these I wasn't able to obtain more information, but I wanted to bring them in to give you a sense of how richly decorated the interiors of this palazzo are. With ancient motifs that you see up here, some of them done in Baroque and or late Renaissance style, these paintings here look like they're from the 1700s. With a beautiful coffered ceiling, very uh, intricately decorated and painted. It's interesting because some of the rooms just feel so much more harmonious than others. This I is, agree. Yeah. Uh, some of them are, were yeah. really altered over mm -hmm. time. That's true. Yeah. Whereas some others uh, survived the uh, redecoration, depending on who owned the palace flat. Mm -hmm. Here's one of those silk hangings. Actually, no, this is leather, as I recall, that's right. in our exhibition. It's quite similar to the motif that you see in this room, which I was unable to identify on the transcripts, but very similar indeed. Yep. Now, moving along, we thought we would include a segment here uh, about the how the palazzos played a role in popular culture. And going through this was really fun um, because there have been so many films done at the Palazzo Kiji. It, to this day, it still is a venue for um, the film industry. And probably there are some different factors that have accounted for that, but some of the highlights we're showing you here in the next few slides. And that specifically a movie called The Leopard, part of it was shot here. And I know that Sarah recently saw this and I think she'd like to tell you some more about it. Uh, well, I, I, it, I was watching for, it, it is considered one of Visconti's masterpieces, and I was watching for the interiors, <laughs> largely, but um, I, I told Daniel, I did check because obviously, you know, Burt Lancaster in an Italian film, um, he's being dubbed, but one of the interesting things I found is that um, most of the actors were dubbed, um, Alain Delon, obviously French, and Claudia Cardinale, although Italian, was uh, speaking a different dialect. Um, and so uh, they also dubbed her. So uh, very interesting. It, it is uh, a great film to watch in terms of imagining, uh, you know, the lifestyle of living in a space like that. And the sort of, you know, for, for us today, you know, there's, there's all this luxury, but of course um, there still isn't a lot of the comfort that we're used to in a, in a home. So uh, it, is, it is kind of um, interesting to put yourself sort of Im imaginatively in those spaces and think about what it would really be like. These are some of the original posters from The Leopard. 
which uh, is uh, set back in the 19th century, and it deals with the events that are going to lead to the unification of Italy, and specifically with um, uh, Garibaldi and um, these uh, the changes that were going on in Italy as it was modernizing. Yeah, and and there's a lot about um, you know the sort of this dying way of life, right? It is is part of the movie, and and you know religion is a huge part of the movie too, the Catholic faith. Um, so uh, it is it is a really um, you know interesting look at that time period, and um, it, in in that sense, uh, the Palazzo is a really bittersweet kind of setting because it is about this sort of transformation to a more modern world. Yes, and it looks like it had some beautiful cinematography. Here's Paolo Stoppa and Alain Delon. And the room, the, the room that they used was the Sala Maestra, and specifically the huge fireplace we see here mm -hmm. today. So many different uses of the space. And here's another really neat scene here. Again, also done, I believe, within the Sala Maestra. And they had to, of course, redo some of the decorations in there for you know, the effects that they wanted to achieve in the movie. And it's really neat to see these stills from the time period. Now, more recently, a movie that I saw and that was only done six years ago um, is The Tale of Tales. And part of the film was done here. It's by uh, the Italian director named Matteo Garone. And, um, this is really neat. It's, it's a strange film, but it's basically a fantasy film that retells some very famous uh, uh, fairy tales. And specifically, they're based off of a guy named Giambattista Basile. And they come from different tales, including the Enchanted Doe, the Flea, and the Flayed Old Lady. Some of them are uh, a bit macabre, but it's a very well done film. And here we've got a couple of those shots in which the director is trying to work out this love scene between Vincent Cassell and Stacey Martin. And which room this is in, it's tough to tell actually. Um, I was trying to actually figure that out. I thought it would be the red room, but it's, it's difficult to tell because some of the furnishings were changed for the movie sets. But they're neat to see. Uh, this one is actually the uh, one in which Flavio Chidri's portrait is uh, featured, Sala del Truco, we saw earlier. And um, the cinematography for it is outstanding. I should also mention that in the movie, basically, it's also uh, showing the inspiration what would come give rise to this guy, Basile, the Italian author, to works by the Grimm brothers, Han Christian, Hans Christian Andersen, and Charles Perrault in their fairy tales. This is neat to see how it's been used in cinema. And I think that brings us to our end. Okay. Well, you can stop the screen share, I guess, and we'll say a little bit of a good night. Um, that was really fun. Daniel did a lot. Of, I've been super busy the last couple of days, so I maybe wasn't as participatory as I often am. Um, but Daniel put together such a really rich uh, PowerPoint. He shared it with me earlier and I said, this is so juicy. Um, it is such um, a fascinating, visually interesting uh, place um, to explore. And I think whenever you have a collection that travels um, a, as this one does, you, the story of how it came together and where it's from is, is really you know, compelling. So I think this was a really fun way to look at that. Um, I think uh, if anybody has any questions, we're happy to answer questions. And uh, I'll see if uh, if there's anything going on. Um, no questions. Um, I guess I'll do the, the little wrap up then, uh, which is that uh, Daniel, first of all, I wanted to ask you, when is your next, you've done one, uh, a, there's a two, he's doing a two part sort of more academic look at Bernini and his uh, sort of place in art history and influence. And he's done the first one already, which you can find on our YouTube channel um, and watch at your leisure. Um, and when is part two, Daniel, for that? Um, I am going to quickly, sir, show a slide um, so that I make sure I give the correct information. Sure. Here we go. Bear with me one moment. Just need to get this 
There we go. It will be, whoops, just pull that down on August 12th at 6 p.m. And I will be talking about more works from the exhibition. Right. Uh, okay. And the other thing I wanted to let people know while we're together is that, um, you know, we, we have seen, you know, it's a great exhibition in between the two shows. We are finally getting some, you know, more activity in the museum. I can hear people in the hallways when I'm working and it makes me very to know our live again recorded an audio tour so you can um, come in and access it on your phone and sort of do a self-guided audio tour or you can access it on a laptop before or after your visit um, Daniel and I partnered with some other folks at the museum Kelly Neely our director of education Audrey Scanlon Teller who is an art historian who does a lot of work with us in various ways uh, Faith uh, Harrington, am I getting, <laughs> I feel bad. Mm -hmm. Faith Harrington, who is our relatively new um, Jean Cushwa intern. And uh, she did uh, three painting stops for us. And uh, did I manage to mention everybody? Did that Daniel, me, Kelly, Audrey, Faith. That's it, five people. And we each did three paintings. And uh, I threw in a bonus painting because I had done Bacchus for the Art Bites. So I figured I'd just record something on it. So we have 16. Um, art stops and you can uh, listen at home or listen in the galleries. And if you want more Let's Talk Art, we will be back again in August um, revisiting Joshua Johnson and talking about uh, genealogical research. And, and if you have a portrait of someone and you, you know who they are, um, sort of how to, how to trace that and find out more information. Uh, so that should be pretty fascinating, and I'm glad we're going to spend some more time with Joshua Johnson because it is, as I said, we've got these two really strong exhibitions happening at the same time right now. Um, it's really exciting for us. So uh, thanks, everybody, for being with us tonight, and thank you, Daniel, for all the great work that you just pulled together for all of us to enjoy. Thank you, and you're welcome, Sarah, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. It was a lot of fun.